In a moment, I'm going to pray that God will speak to us. And also for those who are joining with us online as well. But I'm so thankful that you're here today. Thank you so much for being here. And we are going to start a series on the Gospel of John. And I hope to show you why, firstly, it's a profound book. And it's also an extremely relevant book at the moment as well. Um, so let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would hear your voice. That by your spirit, you would speak to each one of us. May we hear what your word said what your word says and what your word is saying into our hearts now. Help me to hide behind your word and may your word speak to us now, I pray. I mentioned today's a, a big day. After this service at 2 o'clock, there's a combined uh, church's prayer meeting at Gateway Baptist Church. If you're able to come to that, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, Kim and I will be going there because our city needs prayer, our leaders need prayer, our churches need prayer. This week I was really blessed to have a visit from the new pastor of the Free Reform Church, which is just over the hill there, and uh, he's in, being inducted today, and uh, he seems like a really good guy, a man of God, and I'm thrilled to be co-laboring here in our part of our city with, uh, with someone who really believes in the Word of God. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of John. If you're using an app, then go to the Gospel of John and after you've, after, uh, you've finished with your social media for the day, just uh, follow along in the Gospel of John with me in a moment. We're going to have a look at the first few verses uh, sometimes I explain to you what the slide is all about. I oddly, probably too oddly, put in a bit of time in my, my thinking about how can I reflect what I'm saying in the background to the slide. So each of these slides, as you would appreciate, is uh, different to each of the sermon slides, I, each of the sermon presentations I do. Just let me explain this one for a moment. This is a scene from the Gospel of John where Jesus forgives an adulterous woman who was about to be stoned to death. It only occurs in the Gospel of John and I hope to show you as we get to this section why it belongs in the Gospel of John. Secondly, the background to that is a copy of what's called the John Ryland's uh, Papyrus Fragment. Uh, also known as P53, and it's P because whenever they find a fragment of an ancient Christian text, they put a number to it. And this is the 53rd fragment they have found. It's called the John Ryland's fragment. It's, it's from John chapter 18. It dates back to the 2nd century AD. And it's uh, under glass in the, museum, the uh, British Museum in London. And it's uh, extremely famous. And it's extremely famous partly because for many, many centuries, critics of the Bible said it's been so distorted from what it was originally that how can we trust and how can it be considered reliable uh, based on what we have today? And then discoveries like this happen where we can compare just this fragment of John 18 and see it is almost exactly what we have had passed down to us 2,000 years later and we can go there you go what we are reading is reliable and I wrote in this week's pastor's desk that there are there are good reasons for us to trust our Bible we as Christians are going to come under enormous opposition over the coming year um there's a number of things that are being set up by governments to actually make it really difficult for Christians. I've been, along with uh, a 
couple of other church leaders in our state trying since uh, April 14, I believe, to have a meeting with the Premier about some of the proposed legislation uh, making it difficult for us as Christians to openly share our faith, to openly pray with people, things that I never thought in my lifetime I would ever have to battle for. So it's copies like this, John Ryland's P53 fragment, which you might think, oh, that sounds all very la di da and it kind of is. But these are the things that give us confidence that what we have in our hand, on our lap, on our device, is actually the Word of God. The Word of God. All right. So this is what I call the, what I'm referring to, this series is the last gospel. And you're going to, I hopefully want to show you why that's significant. It's also, I'm subtitling it, the gospel of belief. And it's the gospel of belief. And let me give you some data, some statistics on this point that I'm making here. The word believe or belief occurs in the gospel of Matthew eight times. As you would expect, I mean, we're talking about believing God, believing his word. It occurs in the gospel of Mark 15 times. It occurs in the gospel of Luke nine times. It occurs in the gospel of John 84 times. This is known by scholars, it's referred to by scholars as the gospel of belief because it is such a prevailing theme throughout John's gospel. So it's the last gospel and this might sound like it, you might think it's the last book of the Bible to be written and almost certainly it, it wasn't. And there's a good probability that... Neither was the book of Revelation the last book of the New Testament to be written. And there's a good probability that John may well have written his gospel after writing the book of Revelation. And there's, I'll give you some of those reasons for that in a moment. The occasion goes like this, that sometime just before... 70 AD, which is a significant date in New Testament history, John had been released from Patmos. We now have documentation dating early 1st century that shows it was Caesar Nero that banished John the Apostle to Patmos, an island just off the coast of Ephesus, where he wrote and received the revelation and he wrote he wrote the book of Revelation. After being released, John was based at Ephesus and he quite probably wrote his, epis his uh, epistles, three epistles, to the church at Ephesus and the surrounding churches at e around Ephesus. Now here's where it gets really interesting. There was a monk in... Uh, the 16th or 17th century um, who was aware that in the, the monastery where he served they had kept and preserved some really, really, really ancient Greek manuscripts written on uh, papyrus and, and a thing called vellum which is leather and they were kept there and they were, they were treasured so so much no one ever touched them and and then he thought well he, he just can i have a look at you know can i have a look and it turns out that one of them dated to uh, 170 ad and in this in this document it's known as the the, the guy the 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 monk, his name was Muratorius, and, and his, this, this document is now known as the Muratorian Fragment. Again, it's another fragment. And it's dated to around about 170 AD, and it lists, uh, I think, 24 
of the 27 books of the New Testament. And this is another thing, because you've got people who don't know what they're talking about. And there's, a, there's a word for that, but I won't use that because it sounds offensive. But it sounds very similar to the word ignorant. In fact, very similar to the word ignorant. And they say it was Constantine who made the Bible. Emperor Constantine put the... He's the one who said these are the 27 books of the New Testament. These are the 39 books of the Old Testament. And that is just... Oh, what's that other word that sounds like stupid? Whatever that word is. That is dumb. And this Miratorian fragment written in 170 AD lists 24 of the 27 books of the New Testament. And with each of them, it has an... The scribe in 170 AD has listed a little bit of the history that passed down to them in 170 AD. And when it comes to the Gospel of John, there's there's something that was passed down that was recorded then as to why John was written. So we know Matthew was written to Jews, we know that Mark was written to Romans and that Mark was the secretary of the Apostle Peter and We know Luke was a doctor who was not an eyewitness and it says that in this Miratorian fragment. And then it says, and when it came to the Gospel of John, it was the last Gospel to be written because when, after John had been released from Patmos, one of the surviving original apostles at that time, so we're talking late 60s AD, AD, late 60s, said to John, and it names him in this fragment, it says it was the Apostle Andrew, who said to John, the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, have been written, they're being well dis- distributed and, and so on. We think you should write your version of events. And you should, because you should do this, Andrew said to John, because you had a perspective on Jesus that Matthew, Mark and Luke did not have. You were close to him. You knew him like more than any of us knew him. Before you die, you should write down your version of events. That's what it says in this fragment. So what we're going to see here is that this, if it was 68, 69 AD or so, that the Jews, many of the Jews had accepted Christ, but many hadn't. And so now what we have is John writing to his Greek audience. He was living in Ephesus. And remember, he was told to look after someone at the cross, if you recall. Jesus from the cross said to John, John, this is now your mother. Mary, this is now your son. John, look after her. Remember that? And John moved to Ephesus and there's good archaeological evidence to say that Mary, the mother of Jesus, moved to Ephesus and was looked after by John. And so this recollection that John was able to give does not include the other information. This is what Andrew, it says in this document, had said. You don't need to put down the Christmas story, not that he used the word Christmas story, the birth of Jesus, all that, just, but, but tell it from your perspective. So what we have is John writing his gospel with a deep, deep burden for his own people to believe that that Jesus was the Christ. Every Jew, whenever they opened the Torah, the very first verse they would read would be what we call Genesis 1.1. Torah means the, the first five books of Moses. And hopefully, most of us know this verse off by heart. In the beginning, God, what? Created the heavens and the earth. The opening verse of Genesis. So John begins his gospel with a deep burden for his own people, the Jewish people. And he opens it with a verse that sounds, if you read John 1.1, you'll notice it sounds uncannily like Genesis 1.1. In fact, John 1 bears a lot of resemblance to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is an overview of the first 11 chapters or so, the first 10 chapters rather, of Genesis. So here we have this, this verse, In the beginning God created 
the heavens and the earth. It was the beginning of all space, time, energy and matter. It was the beginning of God's creative works. And so John wanted, it appears, to have this opening verse of his gospel, which means good news. And it becomes a, the gospel becomes a, a type of literature that tells about Jesus. But every Jew knew that in the beginning it says God spoke and there was. God spoke and there, his word was the creative force. And so the writer to the Hebrews, whoever that was, says this, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So here we have the writer to the Hebrews saying, the universe came into existence by the word of God and he's writing to the Hebrews, which is another way of saying the Jews. So the Jews believe that the, it was the word of God that was the force creating the universe. But there's something else going on here. John is writing to Greek speakers. The Greeks, the philosophers, uh, SPA, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they believed that the universe had this ultimate idea that was the standard for, of all truth. It was the standard of all moral goodness. It was the, the most powerful thought in the universe. And they called that idea logos in english we translate that word as word but the greeks they this was their quest to know the logos and so john very very cleverly is writing his gospel to appeal to his kin the jews identifying jesus christ as the word not just an idea Every Greek quest was for knowledge of the Logos. And there I have it just written in Greek, Logos. You'll notice a little over the O. That tells you you stop there and it's a syllable and who cares, right? Anyway, I spent four years learning all that stuff, so I care. So John's... Logos was not merely an idea like the Greeks had in mind. Rather, John says, he was an eternal, all-powerful person. Get that? Eternal. Eternal in the sense that he is what he is and he will never change. He will never be subject to time. And so when the Christ became a human being, as we'll see in our next instalment, he was still eternal. And there was errors that crept into the church very early on that said, no, 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 no. When he was born in Bethlehem, that's when he came into existence. That is, what's those words I'm looking for? In the beginning, it says, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, moved to Capernaum, was the Logos. He was the Logos. He was the uncreated creator of all things, John says, who has always been the source of truth, and life and he himself out of his own mouth will say that in john chapter 14 john tells us this in the next couple of verses all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men again 
what you might miss is he is in that statement he is appealing to Jew and Greek Jew and Gentile this verse also by the way in the beginning was the word the word was with God the word was God you can have an argument at your doorstep with a Jehovah's Witness about this they'll say ah yes in the in the Greek there's no definite article after the God like before the God and you could basically say yeah hang on let's just go to verse 3 shall we this one all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made can you see right there that's going to stop a Jehovah's Witness in their tracks who believe that Jesus Christ was the first created act of God the Father but can you see how that verse says "Mm -mm, that cannot be because by him Jesus the logos the word all things were made and there was nothing that was made that he didn't make he made everything and he could not have made himself and made everything so we have here this statement of light he was life and the light of men the jews sought light and John's gospel is the only one that describes Jesus attending what was called the festival of lights. The light shines in the darkness, John says. The darkness has not overcome it. Now this is John giving us a summary of what this whole story of Jesus was about. We know the story, but John's given us a clue as to where it's going. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The closing chapter of the Old Testament, the, as Jews would call it, the Tanakh, which includes the laws, the law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets. The last prophet, Malachi, or if you're from Italy, Malachi. His, his last chapter prophesied about john and so now the apostle john picks it up and says you know where we left the story we left the story with the promise that there was a voice coming from the wilderness one who would announce the coming of the messiah let's pick up that story shall we there was a man sent from god whose name was john he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might here's that word believe through him I hope to show you that when we talk about belief, what you're going to see in the Gospel of John is that there are some people who believed that Jesus could do certain things, but they didn't believe in him yet. There were many people who came to Jesus because they believed he could do miracles, but they didn't yet believe in him. And then John will tell us that there were people who did that, and then they did come to believe that Jesus really was the eternal Son of God. And this will be a progression through the Gospel of John. But this word believer, we use it like, oh yeah, we just think something. We just, But that's not the way John is going to use that word. He's going to use the word like this. They believed Jesus could do a miracle, but then they believed in him. Then they became a believer. And that word believer means one who follows. Because they've now put their trust in that person. That's what it means to be a believer. It's actually a precious word. Believer. He was not the light. John the Baptist was not the light. But came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Now we know whom John the Apostle is talking about. He's talking about Jesus. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Can we just point out that you might know about Jesus, but you may not know Jesus. You might have head knowledge about some of the facts that you think 
about Jesus, but yet not know Jesus. He came to his own, but they didn't know him. What, the Jews who saw him, heard him, didn't know he was there? Of course John's not saying that. But it does show us that there's a type of intimate following, dedicating your life to someone, that John is meaning when he uses this word, know and believe. And his own people, he says, did not receive him. Can you imagine that? This is amazing. Jesus Christ, as we even heard in our children's play today, was the perfect man. He was the embodiment of love. I've got a sneaking suspicion the world doesn't know what love is. Hmm. But Jesus was love. He was also the smartest man that ever walked the planet. And people thought he was dumb. Who reject, people who rejected him. They thought he didn't know what he was talking about. At one point he was accused of being insane. You're mad. Jesus was the embodiment of goodness. And yet the world ended up hating him. You see, some people like to have a Jesus that they've created. And the Apostle Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where he says to the Corinthians, it's my fear that some of you might be enticed to believe in another Jesus. A Jesus that the false teachers have invented just to appeal to you. And John doesn't want people to fall for that either. He wants people to come to know the real Jesus, that you might, and he says it right at the end of his gospel, these things I've written so that you might believe, which means to put your faith in him, to put your trust in him, to live for him. But to all who did receive him, how did, you rece how did they receive him? Who believed in his name. Not that I think his name is Jesus. Yeah, I believe it's Jesus as well. No, that's not the kind of believe in his name. A person's name was the, was the statement of who they were. It was their reputation. Proverbs 22 verse 1, a good name is to be chosen above riches. A good name, it's your reputation. It's what your name stands for. And what the name of Jesus stands for is Saviour. In fact, the name Jesus actually means Saviour. Saviour from our sins, as we heard in the children's play today. To those people who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right, that word right is translated in, appropriately translated in some English translations as authority. The authority to become children of God. You get this? Jesus came to forgive people of their sins, to reconcile them to God. And that's the only way you could be reconciled to God, by having your sins atoned for, cleansed and removed and forgiven. But it doesn't stop there. To become children of God, sons and daughters of God. The king. That means you don't just become a Christian by saying, God, please forgive me of my sins. It starts there, but it doesn't end there. Your eyes become open to everything that now means. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine this concept where you make a decision and then the next morning someone knocks on your door? And gives you a bank book. And you go, what's this? It's your bank book. What, new, what, what do you mean? Bank? You open it up and there's an unbelievable amount of zeros in it. I've got a lot of zeros in my account, but they're at the wrong end of the decimal point. But imagine this one. You, get, you, you go, all I, did was, all I did was say I'm going to follow this guy and he's now giving me this? And the guy says, yeah, but that's not all. New citizenship papers... What's this? 
you now have diplomatic immunity in eternity. What? Oh yeah, but that's not all. And on it goes. He's now adopted you as his son or daughter. You're now his. Any needs you have, he'll look after. Wow. Wow. This is what Christianity entails. It's not something you go, oh, okay, I think I'll become a Christian. And John is about to say, as he will say through his gospel, you don't do this because you get a, you become smart. You get this because the Spirit of God, whom Jesus will describe as being like the wind, you can't see Him, but you can feel Him. When the Spirit of God comes, He will open your mind. He will show you things that you didn't see before. And one of those things you will see is your need to be forgiven of your sins. Your need to stop living as if you were boss of your life and to start to live as if He who really is the boss of your life, you start to live the way he wants you to live. So we have John say this, it's not because you were born to Christian parents, it's not because you were born to a particular family, you weren't, it's not because you were born in any country, it's not because you speak any language, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God does something in your heart. God opens your eyes. God does something where you cry out to God, God, I really want to live for you. I really want to know you. That's my prayer. I want to know him. Jesus will say in John chapter 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's eternal life. To know in the Hebrew sense of the word know. It doesn't mean just head knowledge. It means intimate relationship with. That's why. Therefore, Christianity is actually about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We get it even from these opening 13 verses of this opening chapter of John. It is about a relationship with God through Christ that is now freely offered to all who will receive him. And I hope you will. I hope you have. But if you haven't, I hope you will right now receive him. Father, we thank you that we have an opportunity along with the rest of the world to take this moment to reflect on your sending of your son into this world. And Father, for those who perhaps never have appreciated who this Jesus really was, I pray, Lord, that a grander, greater, fresh revelation that when it says in the beginning was the word, it's announcing a new beginning. The Genesis 1-1 beginning was the beginning of space time energy and matter but now we have the beginning of a new life a new opportunity a new relationship with god a new beginning and father i pray that in this opportunity to enter into a new beginning there are some people listening to me right now and they desperately need a new beginning for them life has been tough it's been hard and now they need a new beginning. And you're offering that because you sent Jesus. He announced it. This is a new day. It begins right now. It begins now. If you have never received God's offer of forgiveness, if you have never received his offer of adoption, you may never have had a dad he wants to be your father. Maybe you had a dad and he wasn't much of a dad. I absolutely guarantee you, God the Father will be your perfect father. Loving, kind, generous, ready to listen, ready to help. 
This is the God whom we are telling you about, who sent his son into the world. And now he extends to you this offer. Come to me, receive me, believe in me. And I will give you a brand new life. If that's you, you're not, as you might think you are, a million miles away from God. You're just one prayer. A prayer that cries out to God. It could be as simple as the word, help. God, help. Help me in this situation. Help me now. It could be even a little bit more sophisticated and throw in some religious language like, Dear God, please save my soul. Forgive me of my sin. Come, cleanse me and help me from this point on to live for you. And Father, for those of us who perhaps have been too distracted by the cares of this life, the cares of this world, the priorities of this world, I pray, Lord, that this would be a recalibration that their life belongs to Christ. So Lord, may we know the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the empowering fellowship with the Holy Spirit who makes it possible. In Jesus' name I pray and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.